stuff out. So, yeah, I I have a lot more in common with late starters than you than I think most people realize because I didn't I didn't figure this stuff out until I was oh, fifty. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of exactly when it came together. So I I mean I spent a long time wandering in the wilderness uh, you know, before I I figured out what I now call the simple path. Oh, I had no idea that it was that late. And um, that will make our community feel, I think, much better about their path. Uh, and honestly, mm -hmm. that is not something I knew about you. I, I would have thought you'd gotten it right earlier in life. No, I, you know, I, I think one of the things that makes transitioning to, to index fund investing, and which, of course, is what I recommend, is I, I one of my dirty little secret is I achieved financial independence picking stocks and picking actively managed funds that were run by stock pickers. And, and the fact is that if, if you do that well enough, that works. And I did it well enough that it worked. The problem is it doesn't work as well as indexing and is certainly a lot more effort and, and, and time and, and work involved in, in, uh, in making it work. So uh, indexing is, is not only more powerful, but it's a whole lot simpler and easier. Well, let's jump in now to our formal talk because this chit chat is actually exactly what we want our audience to hear. All right, uh, let's let's go for it. Okay, um, Becky, I think you're the one that's going to be doing our introduction. So let her rip. Let's roll. All right. So J. L. Collins is the godfather of Phi the purveyor of the idea of FU money, and the smooth operator of index fund investing. JL has worked at about every job you can think of, from selling fly swatters door-to-door -door and pumping gas to ad agency founder and investment officer. He's traveled the world by plane, train, boat, rickshaw, and elephant. He's an author, a blogger, and the creator of Chautauqua, which is a financial retreat held in cool international locations. But JL is best known for his stock series on his blog and his book, The Simple Path to Wealth, which has been translated into many languages and has sold over 500,000 copies. JL, your book, Simple Path, has been the gateway to do-it-yourself investing for hundreds of thousands of people just like us. People who need a simple path to understanding and investing in the stock market and a roadmap to financial independence and a rich free life. And I'd like to just interject a little bit of a personal story here. JL, my husband and I got our financial life turned around with Dave Ramsey. And when we got to the end of that, we thought that was it. We knew everything we needed to know. Then we were introduced to the FI community through the Choose FI uh, podcast. And the short version of this story is we started listening to Choose FI in 2017, right after they started it. You were on episode 19 <laughs> and we had, we started in May at the beginning and started listening through it. We listened to your episode and we had struggled a, a lot with investing. We had gotten the savings and getting out of debt part down, but we had really struggled with investing. We listened to your episode, got your book, read it. And probably 30 days later, we fired our financial advisor <laughs> and started doing it on our own. We even took the huge tax hit that it, it took to do all of that at once. And by the end of the year, we had uh, gained all that back. So you made a huge impact on us and on our path to financial independence. So we're so excited to have you here today. JL Collins, welcome to Catching Up to Phi. Well, thank you, Becky, and thank you for the wonderful introduction, and uh, I'm glad the huge impact I had was a positive one. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was. It was. Well, the, the same is kind of true for me. Uh, I woke up 2016 or so, right about the time that your book came out. It was one of the first books I read, and I was like, why did I not hear this when I was in the womb? Why did I not hear this when I was 10 years old? Uh, and uh, it, it, it didn't matter because it gave me a path. And you call it the simple path to wealth. I'm wondering why you call it the simple path to wealth, because do people think that there might be other simple paths or is this the only one we should follow? 
Well, that, that, that's, that might be a more interesting question, at least to me, than, than you realize, Bill. I, uh, I, I was having a conversation with some friends just the other day and about whether or not uh, uh, personal investing is personal, which is what is the common wisdom that is out there. And therefore, there are all kinds of different paths. And I think it's personal in the sense that everybody's situation is a little bit unique. My third book coming out in October, Pathfinders, is a collection of stories, 100 stories from people who've read The Simple Path to Wealth and adapted it to their own unique situations, depending on where they are in life and in many cases where they are in the world. But I call it The Simple Path because, as we talked about earlier, it took me a long time to figure this out. And I tried a lot of different things and a lot of things that that worked. I, I think I mentioned to you that I actually achieved financial independence as a stock picker and picking actively managed index funds. So that's certainly something that works. It just doesn't work as effectively or as simply as the indexing approach that I that I recommend now. So for my view, uh, I've I think I have distilled investing down to not only a very simple path, but the most powerful path. And it's the path that I recommend to my daughter. All of this was written for my daughter. And of course, because I'm out in the public in the public eye, I have followers who love investing and they're forever saying to me, you know, if you just tinkered it in this fashion, it might work a little better. And then I have other followers who are really disinterested in this subject, like, yeah, you know, this just seems really hard to me, you know, to, I got I to gotta monitor two funds. And so, you know, it depends on where they're coming from. But, but yeah, I think this is from where I sit, the optimal path. That's interesting because we talked to Paul Merriman earlier in our show a yeah. few episodes ago, and he has his own version of a simple path. He calls it two funds for life which is basically a target date retirement fund plus small cap value. And he is a small cap value believer. Do you think a simple path like that could work as well as yours? Or is that too complicated using a more volatile index like the small cap value index? So I I, I was unaware that Paul is now has a, a two fund option, you know, with a last time I, I was talking to Paul and, and looking at his stuff, it was a little more complex than that. Those are obviously not the two funds that I recommend, uh, but it's nice to see him getting focused down to something that was simpler. And I think he's a great example. So Paul used to make the case that with, I think there were about four funds that if you back tested it historically, it got a better performance over the decades then my approach, which is basically a total stock market index fund, and then when the time comes, a total bond, and we can talk about when that time comes, a total bond market index fund. And, you know, I will take Paul at his word that when he backtested this, it in fact would outperform my approach. But the concern I had, and that I believe I expressed to him, is that I have enough trouble convincing people to stay the course just with a total stock market index fund. You know, people just feel compelled to deviate. And the idea that you could get somebody to track four funds and rebalance them on a regular basis over the course of decades just struck me as being unrealistic, even if you could get a slight uh, improvement in performance and the performance performance improvement was pretty slight. So that's again, one of the reasons that I think what I put forth in the simple path to wealth is optimal. It's interesting because I reread your book for this uh, interview uh, after years, and I had succumbed a little bit to moderate complexity. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was a Paul Merriman believer and I still am. And I'm also a Jim Dolly white coat investor believer. So I took a hybrid approach between all three. And after reading your book, I'm like, 
maybe I should simplify things a little bit. <laughs> maybe because you're what you say is absolutely true. It is a little harder. Uh, you're more resistant to say rebalancing because it's a little more complicated. And I could see myself with age migrating back to the simple path from a moderately complex path. Becky, you're a follower, however, right? I am. I am. In in my case, like I said, my husband and I tried so many different things. Uh, we tried picking mutual funds ourselves. We we at least knew not to pick individual stocks, but we tried picking mutual funds and that turned into an epic fail. And so we did eventually give all of our money over to an advisor. And for a season, he was that that was helpful. He at least got us out of the ditch and got things moving forward. But then after uh, and we could talk about this later, but after mainly understanding what we were paying in fees then we decided that that it was possible. I mean, I still feel like I don't really know that much about the stock market, but mm -hmm. your explanation of it and how to deal with it and how to invest in it just made total sense to me. So I am a believer of this <laughs> simple path. And, and, you know, JL, your book is really a game changer for lots of people. In fact, we have a community member, Alex, that wanted to express his gratitude and he wrote i quote for the greatest book he has ever read and he wow. gives it out he gives it out as gifts and so i wanted to ask you so who did you write the book for what what was your um what was your end game in writing simple path so first of all i a uh, big thanks to uh to alex that's that's certainly high praise indeed and before we go on to who I wrote it for, I just I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, uh, you know, Paul uh, Merriman and 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 uh, Jim Dahl are for anybody who follows what they recommend will get great results. I think it's important to remember that you know we're not talking about something that works and things that don't work. We're talking about a matter of of degrees. So if you follow their recommendations. Is I, I not for a moment suggesting that what they're recommending is is bad. I just want to be clear about that. And if you follow that, and particularly if you follow it precisely over the decades, you will get great results. So finally, Becky, to answer mm -hmm. your question, uh, all of this uh, I wrote for my daughter, and uh, you know I I made the mistake early on of pushing this stuff onto her when she, way too soon when she was too young. Uh, who knew four-year-olds didn't want to go through the Wall Street Journal with you, but, you know, there you go. And so the end result is that by the time she was old enough to hear it, she just didn't want to hear it. And she came home from college one day, and I started in on one of my many lectures because it's so important. If you get money stuff right, you know, life is much easier. Uh, and if you don't get money stuff right, life can be incredibly hard. So it was important to me. I wanted my kid to have the best possible life. And so in any event, I started in on one of my lectures and she stopped me and she said, you know, dad, I get it. I mean, I understand this is important. I just don't want to have to think about it all the time. And that was an epiphany for me because I realized at that moment that my daughter had better things to do with her life than think about money and investing all the time, as do most people. You know, it's only weird people like me that enjoy thinking and talking about this stuff. And so The Simple Path to Wealth was really written for her against the day. In fact, the blog was started for it, archive the information to begin with. And of course, that evolved into the book, The Simple Path to Wealth against the day when she was willing to hear it, hopefully willing to hear it. And by the way, she has, and she's on the path and all is good. And her superpower is that she doesn't care about this stuff. And I think that's a superpower potentially for a lot of people is investing is made to seem to be incredibly complex. And the way Wall Street presents it, it is incredibly complex, but it doesn't have to be. You just have to get a couple of key things down, a couple of understand a couple of concepts, 
put it on autopilot, and then you are best served by paying as little attention as possible and going about your life. And that's so my daughter, when the market crashes and people who are actively engaged with this stuff are panicking and thinking whether they should sell or not, by the way, the answer to that is no, you shouldn't sell. My daughter isn't even going to notice that the market's crashing, you know, because she's going to go on with her life. And 20 years from now, she's going to look at her accounts and, and see what's been accomplished. I think that's uh, very comforting probably to our audience, because for those of us that wake up late and go, oh my gosh, what do I do now? Then probably this is on the front of their mind a lot. Mm -hmm. They they think about, you know, what the mistakes they've made, at least I did, about the mistakes they've made. And then what do I do to fix it? And and but once you get things turned around, straightened out and understand how to head in the direction you want to go in, then I think it would be very comforting to our audience to know you don't have to think about this all the time. No. And in fact, you know, investing is one of those weird things where the once you understand these couple of key concepts and you've put things in motion, then investing is one of those weird things that the less attention you pay to it, the better you will do. You know, my daughter, who was, pays virtually no attention to it, uh, is going to outperform almost every active fund manager out there who is spending their lives, highly intelligent people, you know, spending their lives trying to figure out day to day, moment to moment, what the market's going to do. I uh, love the uh, uh, the quote that you have mentioned in the past about the, I believe it's a fidelity study that study the performance of investors yeah evidently that's that that study is a myth oh really okay i've come, i've come to find out that there actually is no study <laughs> along those lines but it's still the point is still the same and the and the study supposed study was that fidelity had looked at all of its investors and the category of investors that did best were dead people <laughs> <laughs> because obviously they weren't making any changes <laughs> the second best category were the people who'd forgotten that they owned the account <laughs> and once they forgot they weren't making any, any changes. so even though the study didn't take place or at least evidently it didn't uh i, th I think it still makes makes a very valid valid point you know jack vogel uh was famously said once uh, i think when the market was plunging as it does periodically and which is a perfectly normal part of the process uh, vogel evidently said uh, don't just what was it don't just do something stand there <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Good advice. It's funny uh, that you say that your daughter wouldn't listen to you and you were a lecturer. My kids call me lecture daddy. When I woke up, <laughs> uh, I was preaching and preaching. You'd have thought I'd been on a soapbox. Yeah. Uh, my kids were just, it fell on deaf ears. Uh, and in order to find some repository for all of my energy and the rabbit hole I was going down, I started a community called Financial Literacy Project and dumped all the wisdom I could find in there. And that has since morphed into catching up to Phi. But lecturing does not work. You've got to find the moment where people are willing to listen. It's that person that takes you aside and says, oh, you should think about doing this, or you should think about reading A Simple Path to Wealth, where it's more passive as opposed to actively trying to change somebody's mind. Right. We live in a fight or flight world. We are you know, fighting against our own minds in this realm. And I can say, thankfully, that I've gotten one of my sons to read your book. And he said, you know what? He makes it fun because he's so funny. <laughs> yeah, well, we ought to get your son together with my daughter. And, <laughs> so so uh, probably about five years ago now, I, I, I was out in California. And I was visiting DreamWorks. They'd invited me to, there's a small cadre of people that work there that are interested in my blog and book. And they invited me to come out and give a little talk and do a little Q&A. And my wife and daughter were with me. And so after lunch, we were in this room that they put together and, and I'm taking questions. And my wife, Jane, and my daughter, Jessica, are sitting on either side of me. And at one point, a woman in the audience addresses 
her comments to Jessica. It wasn't a question, just a comment. What she said was, you know, it must have been wonderful growing up with this man as your father. <laughs> and my daughter looked at this woman and she looked at me and she looked back at this woman and she said, not as much as you think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that actually begs the question that I haven't heard much about is your sort of developmental financial acumen. But take us back for a minute as to, you know, were you a natural saver? Did your parents impact you? How did you discover, you know, that that, that the power of, I know it was more complex for you earlier, but it sounds like you were a saver anyway, because you did technically retire early. What influenced you earlier in your life that made the big difference? Well, you know, I'm not, when it comes to the savings part, I'm not entirely sure because I was a saver from the beginning. And Becky mentioned that, uh, you know, my, my long career that I sold Fleiswaters door to door. Well, I was five years old when I was doing that. My father was a manufacturer's rep and he had a line of Fleiss waters at one point and he had old samples that, you know, he didn't need anymore. And he gave them to me to, to sell. So I was kind of an ambitious entrepreneurial kid and I liked saving money. I remember my mother uh, telling me, oh, you know, if you save enough money, you can buy a convertible when you're 16. <laughs> uh, so that might have been part of it. Uh, <laughs> But in terms of the investing part of it, um, my dad was self-employed and he was fairly successful and we had a pretty comfortable life, but he was also a cigarette smoker. And as the cigarettes began to erode his health, that also eroded his ability to work and earn. And we went from being fairly comfortable to being very uncomfortable. And... Um, that I think was a scarring time for me. And it kind of happened when I was in junior high school and high school and, and, uh, you know, cigarettes uh, kill you very slowly. They debilitate you first. And that's what happened to my dad. And uh, I, and he had not been a saver or an investor. Uh, and so we fell on hard times. And I, I think, I, I remember wanting to be sure that I was never in that position. And I always wanted to have money uh, available if for whatever reason I lost a job or I couldn't work or I simply didn't want to work for a while, which was a concept that occurred to me later in life. So I think that was one of the motivating factors that that implemented the uh, the benefit of being a saver, if you will, into being an investor. Yeah, there's a, it seems to be a traumatic event that, you know, creates the change. Uh, for me, it was turning 50. And so I wish I'd had a traumatic event earlier in my life, quite honestly, because that is a huge motivator to change your habits, change your behavior. Uh, and that's a common thread in our community with stories that we hear from them about things like divorce or other financial trauma that leads them to say, you know what, there's got to be a better way. Right. Right. Let, let's it's dig into the, sometimes let's, takes the trauma. Yeah, let's let's dig into the meat of our talk here today. And let's start with a you know common question. I, I don't know if you came up with this term or not, but what is FU money? Well, so first of all, I, I didn't come up with that term. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I don't think anybody really knows where that term originally came from. I first came across it uh, reading a book called uh, Noble House, which is the last of a trilogy by James Covell that starts with Taipan, great series of novels. And in Noble House, there is a character and her ambition is to have FU money. And that was the first time I had ever heard that, that term. And it, it, it immediately resonated with me because I, I knew I wanted to uh, accumulate money as a buffer against the bad things life can throw at you as they did my father. Um, but I never had a term for it. And I, I certainly never heard the term financial independence or fire. I didn't actually hear those terms until after I had started my blog in 2011. But the FU money term just, it resonated and gave me an idea of, of what, of 
it put a label on on what in the back of my mind I was trying to accomplish. Okay. Well, one of the things that leads you to want FU money is debt. And you have, you know, certainly particular opinions on it. And I believe you've never held a car payment. Why is debt so important in our journey to financial independence? And how do you recommend we avoid it? We seem to be numb to it in our society, and it gets us in trouble. Yeah, it gets us, gets people in huge trouble. I, uh, when I was writing The Simple Path to Wealth, actually, uh, my editor, uh, I didn't have a chapter on debt because I've never had debt. I mean, I was, you know, I was a the way I was raised, if you couldn't pay cash for it, you couldn't afford it. And you mentioned car payments. My father always bought cars for cash. He'd buy a new car every five years. And and the moment he bought that new car, he would start, start depositing money every month into a bank account. So the bank paid him interest instead of paying interest on a loan. And then at the end of that five-year period, when he needed to buy a new car, wanted to buy a new car, then he took that cash and, and continued the cycle. Um, so I've never had any experience with debt. And when my editor said, you know, debt's an important thing. There really ought to be a chapter about debt in the book. That was a little bit of a challenge for me. Because, of course, he was absolutely right. Debt is critical. You can't really achieve financial independence if you're carrying debt around. It's it's like a ball and chain uh, around your ankles. So uh, the I think the first step is being aware that it's a ball and chain. I think in our culture, in our society, uh, you know, we're trained basically that debt's normal. That, you know, of course, you deserve whatever it is that you want to buy. And there is an easy credit plan uh, to enable you to buy it. And uh, but that wasn't always the case. College educations, for instance, I think are a great example of that. When I was in college back in the Stone Age, uh, you know, it would have been very hard or almost impossible to find somebody to lend you money to pay for your college tuition. And eventually, you know, that became common. The government started backing these kinds of loans. And the moment that you could finance a college education, not surprisingly, the cost of college education skyrocketed. The same thing, by the way, happened with automobiles. You know, when people first, first buying cars, you know, there weren't car loans, uh, but the moment the sellers figured out that, well, if we can figure out a way that people can borrow money to buy this product, we can probably sell a lot more of these products and throw a lot more money. So there's a, it's sort of ingrained in our culture that taking on debt to buy stuff is normal. And I think the first step is understanding, yeah, that might be normal, but it's deadly to your financial well-being. Mm -hmm. True. So we're going to, uh, through the course of our conversation today, we're going to dig into different kinds of investing and, and your uh, take on that. But I wanted to start with something that you don't necessarily consider a great investment, which is real estate. So let's chat just for a little bit about your real estate experiences. Well, I, so uh, First of all, I, I I think real estate can be a great investment. Mm -hmm. uh, where where I I um, maybe differ is that I cringe at this idea that seems to be commonly out there that real estate is an easy way to accumulate wealth. It's a great way to accumulate wealth, but it's not an e easy way to accumulate wealth. If you're going to be a real estate investor, you are basically going into a business. And if you take the time to learn that business and learn how it is done well, then yes, you can be very successful. I was actually on a uh, podcast I recorded last week with Scott Trench, who is the uh, CEO of Bigger Pockets, which is a very successful real estate podcast. Um, and if you're going to go into real estate investing, then you ought to be listening to, to bigger pockets. You ought to be reading books about real estate. You ought to be doing your homework. 
And if you do those things, then real estate can be very powerful. It's important, and Scott and I talked about this in the podcast, it's important that you be sure that if you're going to invest in real estate, that you can actually outperform a total stock market index fund, because that fund doesn't take any of your time. And real estate, even if you farm out a lot of the stuff, is going to take your time. And so you're entitled to, and you had better expect a better return than that. Well, again, that speaks to doing it well. Uh, I think, Becky, you were alluding to my second book, which is How I Lost Real Estate, Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable, which is the comic tragic story of the very first thing I ever bought, which was a Chicago, was a condo in, in Chicago. And I think it's in, in, in I the subtitle of that book is A Cautionary Tale. And I think it is in the sense that I made every possible mistake you could make with that particular piece of, of real estate, both buying it to live in, which was my, in, my initial intent, and then as it morphed into being a, a rental uh, because I couldn't unload it because the Chicago real estate market had absolutely collapsed at that point. So uh, yeah, that's uh, it's a cautionary tale. And I think as part of your real estate education, that's a very short, fun, you can laugh at me and all my mistakes mm -hmm. book that's a cautionary tale for anybody who thinks about buying real estate and thinks it's going to be easy and thinks that they can do it without doing their homework. You also talk about our houses, the American dream, our houses, and you call them the worst investment, or actually they have characters of the worst investment. Can you take us through what those are and what the worst investment really is? And why does a house, why is a house potentially synonymous with that? Yeah, you know, I should probably call that post up so I could, I could remember it. That it's interesting about that post is that I, I did that as kind of a lark. I had I had uh, been at a a banquet dinner and I was sitting next to a woman who was talking about trying to get her 20-year-old son to buy a house. And that just seemed like terrible in uh, a terrible idea given the more she talked about this son. And so I, uh, uh, the next day when I was home, I, I rattled off this post. It turned out that it's the most read uh, post on the blog. It is the one that's drawn the most hate and the most love, depending on which side of the fence you're on. Now, the truth is I've owned houses most of my adult life. The difference is I don't buy houses expecting them to be great investments because they're not. Sometimes, these are the people who hate me for this post, sometimes people get lucky and it turns out financially very well for them. Of course, sometimes, you know, people buy in areas that don't turn out very well, like Detroit as an example. And then there are people who bought in San Francisco who did extraordinarily well, but I was just visiting a friend in Detroit and he's taking me around showing me how the, the city's in a renaissance. And of course, San Francisco's in the news these days for all the terrible things that are happening there. So who knows, maybe 10 years from now, the story will be, boy, those poor people who bought in San Francisco and look at these smart people who bought in Detroit. So that's lesson number one. You don't really know. It's a, it's a tough thing to, to figure out. I see houses as expensive indulgences. And as I say, I've owned them for most of my adult life because I've always bought houses that I could easily afford. And I bought them because they were going to provide a lifestyle that I wanted to spend my money on at that time. But if, and in fact, when I was more focused on simply building my wealth, I lived in cheap rentals because I'm never going to be tempted to, to rent more space than I need at that moment. I'm never going to be tempted to renovate the kitchen uh, in that rental or the bathrooms, which are expensive things. I'm never going to have to worry about my real estate taxes going up. So if you want to build wealth, you want to keep your expenses low on the big things like cars and houses. And renting is 
the best way to keep your expenses fixed, among other things, and and as low as possible because you are in the position to rent only what you need. So what does our, you know, what do my kids do now? We've got escalating rents, we've got high house prices, we've got inflation. What do you see people, and it is location dependent, obviously, but it seems right. like a lose-lose. Well, again, it depends, you know, so I, I have a post um, called Wings versus Roots or something along those lines where I, I do the analysis of the house I had in New Hampshire when, which I immediately sold when my daughter went off to college and we moved into a, into a rental. One of the criticisms that I get about that post is people say, well, you went from this 3,500 square foot house to a 1,200 square foot or a thousand square foot, I forget the exact numbers, rental, and that's not apples to apples, which is precisely the point. You know, I was in a house that I, I, I didn't need the size of that in an apartment I could I could focus on it. There, even when you look at houses that have done well, where people have gotten lucky and bought in the right neighborhood and their house has gone up, when you really analyze those numbers of the money that they put into the house over time, the cost of buying and selling it and et cetera, and you look at the actual profit they made, and then you compare it to what they might have done in an index fund over that same 10, 20 year period, whatever, you will almost always see an outperformance on the index fund. So to answer, that's a long way around, Bill, to answering your question, I wouldn't worry about it. I, I would, I think your children, if they need a house, um, because let's say they want to be in a certain school system, if they're married and they have kids, that's a different thing then you focus on buying that expensive indulgence, thinking of it that way. But if you don't need a house, then my advice would be don't worry about it. Rent what you need, invest the difference. And then when the time comes when you do need or you really want a house, you probably have the resources to do that. That's what my daughter is doing. I was looking at your uh, post, and I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, where you go through some examples of running the numbers. You talk mm -hmm. about running the numbers between renting and, and ownership, and I do own my home. And it really made me stop and think because we have a couple of big repairs facing us. We've been told our heater unit is probably on its last legs. It's a 30-year-old house, and it's the original heater, so that didn't surprise me. But, and then we've recently had a roof leak and the house needs to be painted. And, you know, it, it, I thought, gosh, I, I haven't really thought about uh, amortizing those expenses over time. And how, it, how would that compare to if I were renting a, a house instead of owning it? So it made me think. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and again, I'm not anti-house. As I say, mm -hmm. I've owned most of my adult life, but I, ob I object to, Again, there's this drumbeat, just like debt, there's this drumbeat in this country that you should absolutely own a house, and it's the best thing you can do financially. And that's simply not true. It's not, maybe on, on occasions it's true, but but it's not commonly true. Mm -hmm. uh, when I hear people object to this, they'll they'll say things like, well, my mortgage is less than rent. Well, yeah, but when you're renting... You're not paying real estate taxes and you're not replacing the furnace and the roof. And people tend to conveniently forget about the things that that are not fixed, like they're, you know, people love the idea that their mortgage payment is fixed. And that can be a great thing over time. And certainly if the longer you're in a house, the better it's going to work out. But that's the only thing that's fixed. You know, the cost of repairing your roof isn't fixed. Your real estate taxes aren't fixed. So it is, it is something that bears a lot closer inspection. And the reason I make the point that I've always owned houses is I think some people, when I really read between the lines of their defense of owning a house and, and why it's a good investment, they're really justifying what they want to do by trying to make it work 
as an investment and being the better economic choice. And you don't have to do that. If you have the money, you can buy things that are not the optimal choice. I mean, every time I bought a house myself, that was not the optimal financial choice. I could have done better things with that money financially that would have made me wealthier today. But it's not, you know, our lives are not all about just accumulating money. That's an important part of it, but to enhance our lifestyle. So at a certain point, and going back to Bill's question, when your children need a house, uh, then if they've done the other financial parts right, they'll be in a stronger financial position to buy that house. And I'm always a believer in buying things from a position of strength. So, and that means also not buying houses that stretch you financially. You should buy houses that you can easily afford. Okay. We've gone down a bit of a deep dive on real estate. You're not known for real estate. You're really known for stocks, bonds, index funds. Let's transition into your thoughts on why we should invest in the stock market. Oh, that's the question. <laughs> I was I was waiting for the for the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> so let well let me make this statement. Um, sure, JL. So that our listeners all have the same starting point. Can you just quickly give us a definition of a stock and a bond, and and then uh, the stock market? Sure. So uh, you're going to have to remind me of Bill's question again if when I go down there, but. But basically, when and I think this is this is a great question, Becky, um, because people get, especially when it comes to stocks, they get confused because there's a tendency to think of stocks as these little bits of paper or these little bits on your computer these days that you just buy and sell. And that's certainly true if you're a trader. But I'm not a trader and I don't advocate trading. I'm an investor, which means I'm looking at the long term. So if you're doing anything other than thinking long term, you are a speculator or a trader, not an investor. And when you're an investor, when you're buying a stock, you are buying a piece of a business. So if you buy stock in Apple, as example, you own, if you buy a share of Apple, you own a very small, but a very real part of that business. And that means you are entitled to benefit from the results of the operation of that bit of that business. Some of those benefits and results, and Apple's a good example because they've started paying a dividend, might come to you in the form of dividends. Some of those results might come in the form of the business becoming more valuable. Some of the results might come in the form of the business buying back some shares. So there are fewer pieces of that business out there. So your little piece is now a bigger part of the bigger percentage of the hold. But the important thing for people to understand is you are an owner of that business. When you own VTSAX, which is Vanguard's total stock market index fund, and the one that, that I recommend most and that I'm in personally, you own a piece of every publicly traded company in the United States. You own a piece, and this, in my case, I own a piece of every public company in the United States in a very real and tangible form. And so if those companies collectively prosper, which they will do to the extent the United States prospers, then I will prosper. So when you own stock, it's ownership in the business. Bonds, are the, on the other hand, are a loan that you make to whoever is issuing the bond. So if you're buying a corporate bond, you are, let's say you're buying Apple's bond. I don't know if Apple has bonds, but staying with that example, if they do, if Apple issues a bond and they're trying to raise capital to do something, if you buy that bond, basically you are lending Apple money. When you buy treasuries, from the US government, you are lending the US government your money. So when you buy a bond, you're, you're a lender. And the bond will have a term, a certain length. And at the end of that length, whether it's in the case of treasuries, 
you know, it could be days, it could be 30 years, but the end of that period of time, unless your borrower defaults, you will get 100% of your money back. You will also be paid interest as long as that bond is, as long as you hold that bond before it's paid back. That interest rate is determined when you when you buy the bond. So if you buy a bond from Apple, for instance, and it's paying 5% and it's for 10 years, Apple has agreed to pay you 5% every year for the next 10 years. And at the end of that 10 year period, you get the money, all of your money back. So that's what a bond is. So when you're a stock owner, you're an owner. When you're a bond owner, you're a lender. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. And and when I first read your book, um, one of the my big takeaways from Simple Path was to understand what the stock market was and how to not be afraid of it. Uh, so just give us a real quick uh, explanation of what is the stock market? Well, the stock market is basically where uh, traders come together to facilitate the buying and selling of those shares of stocks. So that's what the market is. So when you when you watch the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is the most widely quoted, those are 30 stocks that have been picked that are designed to track the market overall. If you look at the S&P 500, which is a better proxy because it's bigger, those are the 500 largest companies in the United States. So I, if you're going to track the stock market and see how did it do today versus I prefer the S&P 500, um, you can look at that and you can see, oh, it's up, it's down, whatever it is done. That is the collective result in during that day of all the buying and selling that, that people have done. And that's mostly speculation. So in my book and in the blog, I've drawn the analogy, which people seem to like, of, of a glass of beer. So imagine that you've got a glass of beer, but you can't, it's, it's not a clear glass. You can't see what's inside of it, right? So in that glass, there's going to be, depending on how that beer was poured, anybody who drinks beer can appreciate this, depending on how that beer was poured, there's going to be a certain amount of beer and there's going to be a certain amount of foam. Well, in our analogy, the beer in that glass are the companies that we as investors own. That's our piece of that company that we're going to prosper with that company as it does well. So if Apple grows and prospers, that's our beer that we're going to grow and prosper. The foam is all that trading that is done day to day. And that foam, of course, is a measure of how, how full that, that glass is at any given point. You know, so if there's a lot of foam, which means a lot of traders are excited about Apple, well, then that glass is going to be fuller. If for some reason Apple does something that traders don't like, there'll be a lot less foam and it'll look like it's a lot lower. But underneath all that foam, there is that core business that we own and that we care about. If you're a long-term investor, long-term meaning looking out decades, you don't care about the foam. You care about the beer. We're in it for the beer. So one of the things that I think people need to understand is a statement you make that, and you show examples of this with over time uh, graphs in your book. Why does the stock market always go up? Why do we expect it to? So that's that's a, a subject that, that uh, there's a lot of conversation around. And um, I'm not sure I, I buy some of some of what's around, but let me answer it by saying, you know, why does does an index fund like VTSAX, why does that go up? And that goes and in a way that's the stock market, right? So the beauty of an index fund of VTSAX is that it buys everything. So not every company is going to succeed. You know, some companies are going to fail. All companies have a life cycle. They all have a, have a, a 
length of time that which is surprisingly short based on the research but you can take a company like sears right and sears was started i want to say in the 1800s you know for about a hundred years sears was an incredibly dominant company when i was a kid i mean sears was the amazon the walmart of of the day sears built the sears tower in your town chicago um tallest building in the world at the time now sears is an afterthought because other companies just came along and and ate their lunch and have the amazons and the walmarts of what have you in the world so companies rise as companies rise and then they fall in their life cycle but they're replaced by new companies because i own the index there's a process that i've called self-cleansing and that means that as Sears falls away, I already own the ones that are replacing it. I already own Walmart and Amazon and, and what have you. And because the economy is dynamic and the people in those companies are all striving to, to win at this game, I benefit from that. And you mentioned my, uh, my John Goodman video. As I say in that video, when I own VTSAX, Everybody in those companies, from the CEO to the factory floor, are working to make me richer. And when Sears falls away, the worst thing that can happen is it can lose 100%. When Walmart and Amazon are on the way up, they can gain 100% or 200 or 500 or 10,000. So in a sense, it's a rigged game. When I have my own, my index, my losers can only lose 100%. My winners can go on to great heights beyond that. And then when their cycle is over, whatever company is coming along to replace them, I'll own it. I gave a talk at Google in 2018. And one of the, <laughs> one of the comments that I made to that audience was, someday... Google is, is going to be replaced. Someday Google's life cycle will come to an end. Some other competitors will figure out how to replace Google. That was an outrageous thing to say at the time because Google was at the height of its powers. In many ways, it still is. But if I was laughed at for that, and they were too courteous to do that, it would have been no more than if somebody had said that about Sears in 1970. When we look at the stock market, um, I mean, we've talked about how the, the, or touched on how the stock market always goes up, but we look at it day to day and it's all over the place. It's like a roller coaster ride <laughs> Absolutely. and and it, it instills a lot of angst and fear in people. In fact, I've, I've heard people make comments that investing in the stock market, you might as well take your money to Vegas, that it's like gambling. So uh, tell us why investing in the stock market is a good thing and how to navigate all of these ups and downs and this this craziness that seems to be surrounding it. DJL, with regards to this question, you have a great story you tell that I think is worth retelling. Yeah. I think you call it the time machine or the time machine story. If you remember that, can you take us through that? Because I think it actually answers the question. Sure. So if if you will remind me of that and decide, let me let me address her question a little differently, but I but I'll happy to do that because that, that happens to be one of my personal favorite posts. And uh if you remind me, I will surely forget by the time I I I I deal with Becky's question a little bit. But going back to the to Becky to the volatility of, of the stock market and you know, I, I think the reason people feel that way is perfectly understandable because everything they see in the media is about the speculators. It's about the foam we talked about at the moment. It's about the buying and selling and, and trying to say, what's this stock going to do today or next week? It's all very short-term kinds of things. And that is absolutely akin to, to Vegas. It's absolutely akin to gambling. In fact, that's that's what you're doing now. It's dressed up in research and and what have you. And and but nobody can accurately predict what any given company is going to do in the short term. 
So when people have that feeling that this is, man, investing is just like Vegas, well, it's because they're watching CNBC and, and what they're seeing on that television is, they're right, it is exactly like Vegas. But again, we're not, we're not speculators, or we shouldn't be speculators. What I'm recommending is not speculation. I'm recommending, recommending investing for the long term which is why you want to own an index fund that will self-cleanse for you on the long term. So you don't have to worry about, is Sears going up or down? Is Amazon about to peak and begin going down? Or is it going on to great? I don't have to worry about any of that. The index will take care of that for me. Now, the volatility is an important thing to address because the volatility that you see in the stock market, those ups and downs, Key thing you need to understand, and remember at one point I said there's a couple of key things you have to understand, and then you have to implement the, your investing. This is one of the key things. You have to understand with the, when the market drops, and it will drop routinely, or when it crashes and plunges, which it doesn't do often, but it does do, that's a perfectly normal part of the process. And the correct response to that is what Jack Bogle said, don't just do something, stand there, do nothing. So I tell people, if you're not prepared to tie yourself to the mast and ride out the storms without panicking and selling, you don't want to follow my advice. Because if you're going to panic and sell, well, you're now short-term trading, you're speculating. And my advice is going to leave you bleeding on the side of the road if you do that. So the first thing you have to understand, first concept, is do you have the emotional fortitude to watch your portfolio drop when the market drops and ignore it and do nothing knowing that it will turn around and go back to, to greater heights? So, Bill, to the story that you, that I actually did remember it, which surprises me. So, so Time Machine and the Future Value of Stocks as a post I wrote maybe five years ago, six years ago, something like that. And the conceit of that post is that imagine you're in 1975. And I picked that year because that's the year I started investing. So imagine you're, you're sitting around with a bunch of friends in 1975. In 1975, by the way, the 70s were a very difficult time for the stock market. You know, this was a time of high inflation. This was a time of stagflation. Uh, I think 1974 had been a major crash in the market. So you're sitting around with your buddies and and you're all talking and you're saying, well, I wonder if we should be investing in the stock market. And I say, well, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, I can help answer this question because I just got back from 2015. That's when I wrote the post. It's for him to remember. I just got up 2015 uh, in my time machine. So I can tell you exactly what happened in this last 40 years. And then the post goes through all of the terrible things that happened. You know, again, the market was in a in a in a bad way and with hype with inflation and stagflation business week and and I think 78 came out with its infamous cover, the death of equities. Uh, then there was a major recession when uh, the Fed started jacking up interest rates to control inflation. And we had uh, uh, you know Black Monday, which was in '87. We had the tech crash at the end of the '90s. We had the worst economic decline that that uh, other than the Great Depression in our history in 08, 09. And then I go through, you know, not to mention we had the worst attack on our own soil in 9-11 since Pearl Harbor and got into a couple of major expensive wars and, you know, the whole litany of things that bad things that had happened that 40 years. And, of course, everybody sitting around said, wow, I'm sure glad you came back to tell us all that stuff. I'm clearly not going to invest in the stock market knowing that. So, well, by the way, I also checked how the stocks did over the 40 year period. and. On average, they reserve, they return just under 12% a year. And that's actually that's the actual number. I think it was 11.98%. The point of that is that stock market, the stocks to climb, to go up, don't require a golden period 
in time where no bad things are happening. Uh, as somebody once said, stocks climb a wall of worry. So over time, stocks do extraordinarily well in spite of all the bad things that might be happening at the time. You give Mike Tyson a hard time. <laughs> you also, you also, you know, don't don't refer, tell Mike. <laughs> <laughs> you also refer to us as cupcakes. What? <laughs> and you mentioned that we have to be tied to the mast. Uh, how do we steel ourselves ourselves against this? Because if I'm remembering correctly, you made this mistake just like I did at the Great Recession in 1987 in Black Monday. I don't know if people know this, but I think you sold out. You're you're absolutely right, and and one of my and, and I'll tell that story in a second, Bill. And I appreciate you bringing it up. But one of my concerns with my writing is that it's very easy to say you have to tie yourself to the mast, but I wonder, can people really do that? Just being told, just reading that that's the right thing to do, because when the market crashes. It's, make no mistake, it's pretty terrifying. And it takes a lot of fortitude to, to stay the course. And I'm not sure that maybe you don't have to live through one of those crashes and make the mistake of selling out and then turn around and watch the market rebound without you. So 1987, that was Black Monday. Again, the single largest daily drop in the market's history, bar none, I mean, including the Great Depression. Uh, this was before computers and cell phones and all this kind of stuff. I I happened to call my broker at the end of that day just because I hadn't talked to Wayne at the time. This was also in the days when people had brokers. And, um, you know, I'm in a pretty good mood and I'm cheerful and I, and, hey, Wayne, how's it going? And there's this pause on the phone and he said you're joking right and i said no he said man this has been the worst day of my life and he proceeded to tell me that you know the market had plunged i think 26 percent in that day he said i've had people calling me all day yelling at me and and uh nobody knows where it's going from here and that was the first i'd heard of it and i um uh, I knew what the right thing to do was. I knew the right thing was to stay the course and do nothing. And initially, that's what I did. And then the market continued to kind of drift down and drift down. It wasn't as dramatic as that Black Monday, but it kept grinding down and grinding down. And and this was, I want to say, and correct me, Bill, if your memory is better than mine, this was in September the Black Monday happened. So I think September, it was October. Right? October. My okay. birthday month. Yeah, so it was October. So anyway, by, you know, I held out for, you know, two and a half, three months. And finally, in December, I, 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 I just gave up. I threw in the towel and I sold and went to cash. And if I didn't sell at the absolute bottom, it was close enough that it didn't matter because shortly after I sold, the market began to slowly grind its way back up. And by the time we got to the anniversary of that day, it had, the market had recovered all of its losses and and then some, and I'm still sitting on the sidelines. So now I've all I've done is locked in my losses and and uh, you know, I keep waiting for the market to plunge again because in those days, I'm paying too much attention to what's being said on TV. And of course, people are still predicting, oh, you know, it's going to go back down again. and so, uh, but I finally got back in and but that's how I learned. And that's what gave me, frankly, the fortitude when the much worse event of, of 08 and 09 happened. And, uh, you know, and make no mistake, I was, you know, I, I was nervous too. And, uh, but I stayed the course. And I don't know that I would have stayed the course if I hadn't had that 87 experience, because at least for me, and hopefully people listening are made of sterner stuff than I am, but at least for me, knowing what the right thing to do was not enough in 87. I, I had to go through the pain of making the mistake before I had stern enough stuff to 
to not make that mistake again. What can we do, JL, when the stock market goes down? I mean, is there is there any advantage to us in those times? Well, there's a tremendous advantage, especially if you're creating wealth. I, I so first of all, the first thing to do is is to do nothing. Uh, don't sell. If you're set up like my daughter is and like you should be with a regular investment program where you are taking a portion of your income and putting in the market, you absolutely want to continue to do that. In fact, if there is a way you can free up more capital to take advantage of the fact that the market is down, that's a great thing to do. I, you know, if you're young and starting out, or regardless of what age you're starting out at, and you're trying to accumulate wealth, the very best thing that can happen for you is a major stock market crash, because now you're in a position to buy all of these things at a steep discount. Now, of course, you have to have the fortitude to be willing to buy when everybody else is panicking and saying sell. And it's like Warren Buffett said, says, you know, you want to be greedy when people are fearful and fearful when people are greedy. But if you can bring yourself to do that, I mean, market drops are a wonderful time to accumulate shares. Um, now, I don't recommend waiting for market drops to do that because you should be accumulating shares all the time because... If we look at today, for instance, and and I was just looking at an article that was pointing out that the market is now up 20% from its the last low that it hit, and so technically it's been a bull market. So people might say, well, I don't want to buy now because the market's back up again. Well, we don't know. At this level today, this might be the lowest the market will ever be again in our lifetimes. I'm not saying that's the case. What I'm saying is we don't know. So this might be the best buying opportunity. Um, so you never want to stop your accumulation, but you and you certainly don't want to stop it if you're fortunate enough to have the market drop. So market drops, if you have the right attitude and you have the fortitude, uh, can be a wonderful boon to your uh, uh, to your long term investment re your long term investment returns. I think the reason you give I think the reason you give Mike Tyson a hard time is because he said something along the lines is you don't have a, you, you don't have a plan until you get punched in the face. And unless you have a plan, you will get punched in the face and you've got to have the fortitude to stick to that plan. Uh you know, we have the media saying sell sell sell. When why don't they say buy buy buy? You know, we're running out of target instead of running in at the, at these sales. Like people will do it for best buy at Christmas but they won't do it for the stock market. Well, I, th I think uh, to answer the question about the media, I think a couple of things. One is that fear sells papers, or in this case, of course, newspapers are gone, but you know, fear attracts eyeballs. So if, uh, you know, that's why you won't see CNBC inviting me to, to on when the market crashes to say, <laughs> it's not a problem, don't worry about it, you know? And the other thing is, as we talked about, those programs are all focused on the short term. And if the market's crashing and you're a short term speculator, that your hair is on fire. I mean, you should be panicking because, you know, you're you're getting your your tail handed to you. Uh, but if you're looking out 10, 20 years, then none of that short term stuff matters other than as we Becky and I were chatting about a moment ago, it might be a. a unique opportunity to acquire more shares. Let's say you're putting $500 a month uh, into the market. Well, your $500 when the market's down is, is going to buy you more shares. By the way, that's another way to, to, that's another mind way to organize your mind to think about this stuff when the market's down is that the price of those shares might drop, but you still own the same number of shares. The number of shares you have has not changed. So if you can add to that pile of shares at a lower price, then when the market turns around and the price of those shares come back up, you'll be doing just fine. We've talked about index funds and BTSAX. So what is your recommendation for someone who wants to invest and do it in a simple manner? VT, VTSAX, <laughs> index, <laughs> index funds, I, yeah. I, I I think that the tool to it, you know, the complexity around investment or the or the 
difficulty around investment is is not in the tool. I mean, the tool is is the soul of simplicity. In fact, so one of the you know occasionally I get criticism on the simple path to wealth, and that you know people say, well, I can sum that book up in one sentence and buy VTSAX, and and they're not wrong. I mean, you know, the, that's not wrong at all. But understanding why you should invest it and and adapting the right mental frame of mind, as we've just been discussing, are are kind of the keys. And when I say VTSAX, that's Vanguard's total stock market index fund. Um, but to be clear, and I I have a, a preference for Vanguard for reasons we can discuss if you like. But to be clear, if you're with Fidelity, uh, their total stock market index fund is fine. If you're with T. Rowe Price or Schwab or anybody who has a total stock market index fund that is low cost, and almost by definition, they all are, that's fine. By extension, um, if your 401k doesn't offer a total stock market index fund, but it offers a uh, S&P 500 index fund, that too is fine. Because the total stock market fund is cap weighted, which means that it's tilted towards the largest companies. So VTA, VTSAX is about 80% uh, the, the S&P 500 anyway. Uh, so it's, you know, the fact that that it's got a little mid cap, a little small cap is sort of like adding Tabasco to your to your food. It's a little extra spice that I like. But uh, Jack Bogle himself, Jack Bogle, of course, being the founder of Vanguard and the creator of the first retail index fund, uh, which was an S&P 500 index fund, he held that until his death. And I think Jack did just fine. So uh, I have no objection to S&P 500 funds. Is, you know, what you want is a low cost, broad based index fund. So not everybody believes purely in VTSAX. There's the issue of diversification in international funds. For example, you mentioned in your book too that it could be perfectly fine to invest in VTWAX, which is a total world index fund. Do you think there's a time that it's better to do that than just invest in the US economy where you have you know, home country bias? So a great question. Uh, when I'm uh, talking to people overseas, uh, you know, when I travel internationally and sometimes I'm asked to talk to people who don't live in the United States, um, the World Fund is what I recommend to them. Uh, the United States is the only uh, country where it's large enough that you can get away with that home country bias. So if I'm talking to any other group anywhere else in the world, you know, I, I, I would be uncomfortable suggesting that they invest in a country other than their own completely, i.e. the United States. Plus, I think the world is going to move in that direction anyway. So what I say to my daughter is the U.S. is the dominant economy at the moment. I think that is going to continue uh, for the time being, but it is it is changing. So if you go back to the end of World War II, the United States was the only uh, developed country that wasn't in ashes. And so not surprisingly, the United States essentially was the world economy in those days. Uh, almost 100%. And so very large percentage of a somewhat small pie. And then Europe and Asia began to rebuild out of the ashes and with a lot of help from the United States, which was uh, enlightened self-interest on the part of our country. And as those countries began to, to redevelop, well, their share of the pie began to get bigger. And of course, that came at the expense of the United States. Sounds like a bad thing until you realize that the pie itself is getting bigger. So while the U.S. percentage is shrinking, the overall pie is getting big enough that it is we are better off in the United States. That is a process that has continued for the last 75 years. And I think it will continue 
to it will continue down that road as the rest of the world continues to grow and prosper. Again, I think that's a good thing for the United States. But at some point, the United States will be a small enough part of the pie that even for Americans, it they might be better served going to the World Fund. And that's one of the reasons that if somebody is interested in owning international funds, while I don't see the need for it at this point, I certainly don't object, for, object to it. If somebody were to say, you know, I think the time's now, I'm going to go to that World Fund. I'm not sure I'm there yet, but I don't, I, I wouldn't object to it. I think you might be anybody doing that in my judgments, probably a little bit ahead of the curve, but I think that that's where the curve's going. So that's one of the few things I tell my daughter that she probably needs to pay a little bit of attention to other than setting it and forgetting it. Yeah, I actually myself uh, invest in VTWX. Uh, for that reason, because I like to think I'm a contrarian investor with PE ratios being as they are, and I feel like I'm buying international stocks on sale. How do you feel about that if we're, as a contrarian approach? You know, I I, I think it's interesting, and I, I think your your thought process is is uh, spot on. So I have I have no disagreement with that. Uh, you know, you are uh, I'm not doing that. I'm still in VTSAX, so. You and I are are both making our best guesses to what say the next ten years holds, and hopefully ten years from now we'll be sitting around with a cup of coffee and one of us will have won that race. Uh, <laughs> but I, it could just as likely be you, for the reasons that you mentioned. I mean, right now on P basis, you know, U.S. stocks look expensive, and international stocks look like a bargain. Um, I happen to think that there are reasons that U.S. stocks are carrying that premium that are going to continue for a while. Uh, your analysis is a little different. And you know what? I, I could easily see you being correct in 10 years. But I could also almost guarantee that both of us will be much wealthier by virtue of holding these things in 10 years than we are today. So it's not like one of us is going to lose. It's just one of us will be a, a slightly bigger winner. We have a, um, uh, a question from one of our community members, Joanne, and she asks, is there any other index funds he would be recommending today? Well, I, again, I, 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 thanks for the question, Joanne. I, I would say, as I already did, any total stock market index fund from any broker is fine. Any S&P 500 index fund from any broker is fine. Um, if we're talking about stock funds, those are the only ones I recommend. Uh, if she's asking, are there some sort of sector funds I would recommend? I get that question occasionally. You know, would I recommend an index fund in the tech sector or in the banking sector whatever sector somebody thinks is going to do well, th that again, for me, falls into speculation. Um, so, yeah, there's, those are the extent of my recommendations. Actually, you do speculate a little bit because you still have a pension for playing with individual stocks with your play money. And what do you mean by that, play money? Well, so for, first of all... <laughs> I, I haven't owned an individual stock. I'm trying to remember the last time, but I, you know, I, I got to be 13, 14, 15, you know, 2013, 14, 15 was when I finally unloaded the last one. You know, my transition to indexing, uh, you know, it wasn't a road to Damascus kind of event. It was a gradual thing and I, uh, I I frequently joke that I have the disease I mean I I was a stock stock picker for decades and there are few things that are more intoxicating in life than finding a company doing your analysis saying I think this is going to work buying the stock and having it work I mean that's very intoxicating um so it's an addiction and it's you know I I, I have the disease but uh, but for the last, you know, eight years, I'm going to say, 
uh, I've been on the wagon <laughs> successfully and every now and again, I get tempted, but, uh, I, yeah, I don't go there anymore. Well, that's good to know. And let's make, you, you talk about, uh, investing over the long term and, you know, investing into your 401k every paycheck. This is actually a bit of dollar cost averaging, which I guess you're not a fan of with regards to lump sum uh, investing. Can you tell us what dollar cost averaging is and why you're not a fan of doing that with a lump sum? Yeah, so it's uh, when I, I wrote a post about dollar cost averaging. And when I wrote the post, I I neglected to think about the fact that there is lump sum dollar cost averaging, which is what my post was about. But there's also dollar cost averaging that simply comes from your cash flow. So if you have a job and you are diverting a certain portion of your income into investing into your 401k, and hopefully you're maxing that out and then into a taxable account, because hopefully your savings rate is high enough to afford for that, that also is a kind of dollar cost averaging. And I'm very much in favor of that. As we talked about earlier, that's one of the ways that you take advantage of the inevitable market declines. Um, but when it comes to a lump sum, uh, let's suppose that you sell an asset and wind up with a bunch of money or you have an inheritance or however uh, a big chunk of money comes to you. Uh, the debate is, let's uh, let's to make the math easy, let's say you get $120,000. So then the question becomes, well, do I put all $120,000 into the market today? Or do I say, you know what, I'm going to put $10,000 a month in for the next year. And the appeal of doing that, and that's dollar, the dollar cost averaging, is that if you put it all in today, there is a chance that tomorrow will be the day that the market plunges 40%. Because as we already talked about, periodically the market does crash and it could crash the day after you put your 120000 into it. And that obviously would be a very bad day. If your dollar cost averaging is saying, well, that's only $10,000 and then I have the advantage of putting in the rest of my money at these lower rates. So that's the allure. So why don't I like it? Well, I don't like it for a couple of reasons. Number one, mathematically, the odds are against you. So the market goes up on average three out of four years. Now, obviously, it doesn't go up three years and then down a year. That would be way too easy. But on average, the market's going up 75% of the time and down 25% of the time. So what that means is if your dollar cost averaging over the course of that year, that you have a 75% chance of doing less well than if you just invested it all at once. Because if the market's rising while you're doing that, all you're doing is paying more money for your shares each month. If the market's flat while you're doing that, well, you're paying the same for the amount of the same amount of money for your shares, maybe, but you're not invested uh, as early. And so you lose that benefit. The only time the dollar cost averaging benefits you is if you happen to be in that 25% chance, 25% time where the market's actually dropping. And in that case, dollar cost averaging is going to be the winning strategy. So you have to ask yourself, as with any wager that you're making, do I bet where the odds are 75% in my favor or where they're 25% in my favor? Well, to me, I'm going to go with the 75% every time. But here's the real kicker. Let's suppose that you say, no, I, I, I just don't want to take the risk of that market plunging the day after I put my money in. I just, it just feels more comfortable to me to dollar cost average it, and that's what I'm going to do. So you, you do that. And you start in January, and then December, you make your last uh, investment. Uh, in your dollar cost averaging strategy, and now your 120 is fully deployed. And the next day is the day the market drops 40%. So dollar cost averaging really hasn't protected you from that risk at all. 
In fact, this is an important thing to remember outside of dollar cost averaging. Whenever you are invested, every day there is that potential that you'll wake up tomorrow and your portfolio will have dropped by 40%. That's part of the volatility we've already talked about, part of the reason you have to tie yourself to the mask. So the idea of trying to avoid that with dollar cost averaging especially when it's only going to work in your favor 25% of the time. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. Uh, we haven't talked as much about bonds. And given today's interest rates and last year for bonds, do you still recommend the total U.S. bond market fund or would it be as an intermediate duration fund? Would it be better to be in government treasuries uh, in sort of a barbell fashion with short-term treasuries and some intermediate treasuries. Uh, I wonder a little bit about your approach to bonds because of what's happening and you know the, the, the interest rate risk associated with your recommendation. Can you speak to that a little bit? So the, the nature of your question is it's the question of a speculator because as you said, you know, you wonder because of what's happening with bonds at the moment. And I'm not thinking about bonds at the moment. I'm thinking about it as part of the ongoing strategy. So the answer, the short answer to the question is no. If if you're going to have bonds, I think the total stock market, the total bond market index fund, which owns all kinds of bonds, but is in effect an intermediate term bond fund because the short-term bonds offset the long-term bonds and what have you. I think that's a good place to be. Now, why do you own bonds? Well, first of all, in my strategy for a lot of your wealth accumulation years, you're not going to own bonds. My daughter doesn't own bonds. And why doesn't she own bonds? Because she has a job and her cash flow from her job, the portion of it that's going into her VTSX account, is what smooths the ride. It's what allows her to take advantage of those declines that we talked about early on. You add bonds to your portfolio, in my world, when you no longer have that outside income flowing in. Because now the bonds take over for that income that's not there anymore as ballast on your portfolio. So now the bonds are what smooth the ride for you when the market takes its inevitable decline. Uh, bonds are never going to long-term outperform stocks. So whenever you add bonds, you are basically trading long-term performance for smoothing out the volatility and for having dry powder for when the market plunges that you can take advantage of those lower prices. So I'm not looking at bonds for the kind of return they can provide. That's just a nice benefit when it happens. In fact, I wrote a post, again, probably in the 2015 range called uh, the bond experiment or stepping away from the bond experiment or something. And that's where I, I looked into uh, uh, other kinds of bond investments that might give me a better return. And what I determined for myself, and I think for this strategy, is that that might be possible with a lot of work. It's very much like short-term speculation. And it's also asking bonds to do something that I don't think bonds are particularly well suited to do which is to seek performance. If I want to enhance the performance of my portfolio, I'm simply going to increase the percentage of my portfolio that is in stocks rather than try to seek it from the bond port portion of my portfolio. Does that make any sense at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. We just needed to speak to that because you know, I, I don't have the fortitude to be 100% in stocks, especially at age 50. And our audience wonders really, you know, what is different in their time of life if you start at 40 or 50? Is there any real difference? Should you have a different allocation? Uh, our superpower tends to be savings rate over expected returns because we can't take back time. So I'm sorry, I, I lost the question in your comment. Should we have 
what kind of allocation should we have as late starters, say at age 40 or 50? Should it be the same or would you hedge your bets a little bit more given an age factor, especially if you're wanting to retire, say, in 10 to 15 years? So I'm not sure age is the factor that I would consider in making that decision. I think the the factors that I would look at would depend uh, on how close are you shaving it. And by that, I mean, uh, wherever you're starting, you know, you have to look at, okay, where am I starting and how long do I have before I'm going to be living on this portfolio? And uh, how big a margin of error do I have? The tighter that is, the less margin of error you have, probably the more conservative you want to be. And when I say conservative, think more bonds to the to the percentage of stocks. But I also think it's a mistake to think about your money only in terms of your life, which is how most writers in the financial world talk about it. Uh, I think about my investments far beyond my own lifespan because they will continue after I'm gone. So I'm not concerned just about how they perform in my life. So I am, I, you know, my personal allocation is 80% stocks, 20% bonds, which is very aggressive by most measures. Um, it's aggressive because I want the extra performance that stocks will give, because again, I'm thinking beyond if, if I were only thinking of my lifespan, uh, especially at this point in my life, I might be looking at it differently, but also because I have a pretty big margin of error. I have I have more than I need, so I can afford to to take that risk. There are people, by the way, who would say, well, when you won the game, you know, why would you be in stocks at all? You know, you should get very, very conservative. Um, well, I'm drawing a blank on the guy anyway. Uh, there was a great example of that, that I, uh, Ross Perot, uh, maybe some of our list, we, we have an older listening group from what you've said. So people should remember Ross Perot who was a billionaire and famously went into 100% treasuries because he figured that he lost, he'd won the game. Well, my attitude is, you know, I'm not a billionaire by any stretch of the imagination, but I've kind of won the game. And that means that I can afford to absorb more volatile. I won't even say risk because I don't see stocks as being risky in the long term, but I can afford to absorb more volatility because I want my stock portfolio to continue to grow, to benefit my heirs and the charities that it will go to. Um, so the only other, so uh, I, I, when you're looking at, at, at that balance between stocks and bonds, I think the thing you need to read, a couple of things you need to keep in mind. Number one, is that the more stocks you have, the heavier you tilt to stocks, the better your performance will be over time, and the more the rougher the ride will be, the more volatile it'll be. The more you add bonds, the smoother that ride will be over time, but the lower the performance will be. So at the end of 20 years, if you're tilted heavily towards stocks, you will probably have a lot more money uh, than if you're heavily tilted towards bonds. But if you're heavily tilted towards bonds, you will have had a much smoother ride. It's up to the individual as to which of those two things is more important and to which degree. The only last caveat that I would, I would say about that is that if you're thinking about withdrawing based on something like the 4% rule, which comes out of the Trinity study or or the research backing it does, uh, it's important to remember that if you own less than 50% bonds, that 4% guideline begins to break down. It doesn't work so well. So I would very, I, I, I would caution people not to go below 50% in stocks. But other than that, I think it's a matter of, of what makes you most comfortable and meets your needs. We've talked about uh, risk and return and stock index funds and bond index funds. Uh, let's spend a few minutes talking about fees and the drag that that can have on your portfolio. I mean, that's a whole different little uh, idea to think about. 
yeah and it's an it's an important one so first of all i you know i i recommend index funds because over time they outperform actively managed funds and the research on this is pretty clear and and it's pretty dramatic uh um, in fact, if you go out 30 years, I think it's less than 1% of actively managed funds outperform over a 30 period of time. And that's statistically zero. Uh, I think in any given year, it's, uh, you know, index funds outperform 75% of them, something like that. So even from year one, it's a, your, your odds are heavily in your favor with index funds. And one of the reasons, there are a lot of reasons for that. The main reason is that it is extraordinarily difficult to, to pick stocks that will outperform the overall market. But another reason, and it's not a small one, is that actively managed funds carry much higher fees. You know, the, the, the expense ratio, which is another way of saying fee, on VTSAX and, and uh, broad-based index funds like it, is like 0.04%. I mean, it's extraordinarily low. An active managed fund, and they've come down to meet the competition from index funds, but you know, actively managed funds can be anywhere from half a percent to 2%. Well, that sounds low, but it's a huge drag over time. There, there are some, it's worth Googling uh, this because some people have done some great Hosts, and I haven't done one myself, but showing just how extraordinary over time that drag is in terms of total dollars. But let's put it in, in, in another way to put it that's maybe a little simpler. Let's suppose that you have a million dollars and you're going to, that's your portfolio, and you're going to pull 4%, which is pretty good guideline as to what a safe withdrawal rate is out of that to live on. So that's $40,000 a year. But let's suppose that billion dollars has a 1% fee attached to it that comes out. Well, that's got to come out of your 4%. So that means that fee you're paying is now 25% of your potential income to live on. So instead of having $40,000 a year to live on, you're now at $30,000 to live on. So that might be the easiest shorthand to recognize how damaging fees are to your to your financial wealth. Um, if fees got you greater results, uh, you know, great enough to make up for their otherwise drag, that would be one thing. But the research pretty clearly indicates that they don't. So it's an extraordinarily important thing to look at. And it's a particularly important thing to look at for any of our listeners that are using uh, an advisor, uh, because that's one of my big criticisms of advisors. If you're using an advisor and it's and they are not a fee-based advisor, which means you're not paying them an hourly rate, then the way they're getting paid is, is through fees and or commissions on what they put you in. And that means that their needs and your needs are not aligned. Okay. You hear the term, sorry, one, one more question. You hear sure. the term assets under management or AUM. Yeah. So can you describe that? Like, uh, just in case we've got folks in our audience that are just starting with their investments. So how, how do they evaluate these fees? Well, so, so sometimes it could be hard because the fees are, kind of buried and disguised. Uh, but assets under management is that's a way of of for an advisor to get paid. And to be clear, you know, it, they're doing a job. There's no reason they don't deserve to be paid. It's just you as the customer need to be very clear on how they're getting paid. And sometimes they're not as forthcoming as they should. But assets under management is is usually uh, however much of your money they're managing, they will take a certain annual percentage of that for their fee. One uh, percent is pretty common. Two percent is not uncommon. And again, if you think about our four percent uh, kind of thing, you can begin to appreciate how expensive that is. So if you have a million dollar portfolio, 
you know, that's how much that's costing you, but it's not going to be immediately apparent because you're not cutting them a check and sending it to them. Now, in fairness, when I talk to advisors, one of the things they will say to me is, well, you know, customers prefer the asset under management model. And of course, they prefer it because psychologically, they don't see the money going out of their portfolio. Whereas if they're doing it on an hourly basis, a fee basis, where the advisor is charging them a certain amount an hour and they are writing a check and handing it to them, that's psychologically more painful for the customer. So the advisors in an interest, and this is where, you know, um, their interests are not necessarily aligned. The advisor is in a very interesting position because if they charge the way that is best for the customer, which would be hourly, they will have a harder time convincing the customer to pay that than if they just do the asset under management, take their percentage off the top in a way the customer never sees. And so the advisor will say, you know what, I'm just doing what the customer wants me to do. But that's a lot more expensive for you, for you, the customer. So again, it's a conversation that if you have an advisor, you ought to have with your advisor exactly how are you paying them and how much are you paying them. And if you don't like the answer to that question, then the next one is, of course, are they open to a different way of being paid that you might be more comfortable with? You wrote a post recently that kind of summarizes the simple path to wealth. Uh, and it's sort of nine items that you want your daughter to understand. I'd like to go over them a little bit just to remind our audience as we come to a close here, what your primary recommendations are. Number one, avoid fiscally irresponsible people. Never marry one or otherwise give him access to your money. Uh, I, I firmly believe in that. Maybe we should uh, do a wallet biopsy on those potential spouses so that we know if they have significant debt coming into the relationship. And maybe that would be a deal breaker. Who knows? You no. know, if I, if, if I <laughs> there, remember that I wrote this for my daughter, which is why I put him in there. Uh, so I, I don't mean to be biased against men and, and because uh, for the men in the audience, you know, if you marry the wrong woman, uh, she will squander your money just as readily as, as uh, uh, if my daughter marries the wrong man. So. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. We don't think about it. Marriage is usually an emotional thing or partners is usually an emotional thing. We don't think about the fact that it's one of the biggest financial decisions we'll ever make. Well, I got one of the, you know, I get a lot of criticisms as I guess anybody out in the, puts themselves out there does. And one of the ones I, I got was from a woman who, who uh, said, you know, I, the moment I read that, I, I just knew that you had nothing to offer because, you know, marriage is not about money. I'm like, well, okay, good luck to you. But the truth is that financial issues are the single biggest source of conflict in marriage. So I stand by my comment. Yeah. And now number two is avoid money managers that we just talked about. No one will care for your money better than you. And quote, advisors who put their clients' interests ahead of their own are, to steal a phrase from the edge of dark water, quote, rarer than baptized rattlesnakes. Isn't that a great quote? It's, it's a great one. Yeah, you, you have a bunch of this. It's, it's just the tongue in cheek in your book is uh, truly heartwarming. Number three is avoid debt. Number four is save a portion of every dollar you get. Number five is the greater percent of your income you save and invest, the sooner you'll have FU money. Try 50% with no debt. This is perfectly doable. Number six, put this money in VTSAX. We've beaten that one to death. And number seven, realize the market and the value of your shares will sometimes drop dramatically. We can't emphasize this enough as we have in this podcast. People all around you will panic. They'll be screaming, sell, 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 ignore this. Even better, buy more shares. Number eight, when you can live off the dividends of VTSAX, and that provides you that provide that makes you financially free. Now the dividends typically are two percent. It doesn't meet the four percent rule, but that's a conservative. If you are an oversaver, I guess that's realistic. Number nine is the less you need, the more free you are. And the power of frugalism and value-based spending cannot be overemphasized, I think. 
Now, our group has a few questions to close up, and we'd like to honor those. Sure. Holly, Holly asked, what do you recommend these days for the bond portion of a three fund portfolio? I think about this question all the time as the total bond market index fund hasn't been working out the way I thought it would based on the book. I can't be alone in this. And we talked about that a little bit, but do you have any comments for Holly? Well, Holly, what I would say is, is you're probably reacting to, uh, uh, I think it was last year, 2020, when uh, the total bond market index fund, along with bonds in general, uh, had a particularly brutal year. In fact, I think in this historically brutal year. And so there are no guarantees in investing. And at any given point, any recommendation can can have a bad run. And that was certainly a, a bad run for VTSAX and by extension for bonds in general. But if you refer back to our the earlier part of this conversation, when I went into a little more detail as to why you own the bond fund, uh, which is as ballast towards your for your portfolio for the stock part of it. I, I think it's it's still a good thing to uh, to have, and I stand by the recommendation. So our next question is from Paul, and he says, if JL was starting late, say age 50, with a small 401k or no retirement, what advice would he give? What levers would he pull to close the gap, such as side hustles, multiple jobs, or real estate? Well, so we talked about real estate already, and and you know my take on that real briefly is it's a part time job, and it's a business, and you need to do your homework to learn how to do it, and then it could be a very powerful way to build wealth. So that's that. Any side hustle that you take on that brings in extra money that you're willing to divert to your investments is obviously a good thing, a very personal choice. But if you have ideas for those and, and uh, you can do that effectively, but by all means do that. The other thing I would say is that if you think in terms about the great, uh, the aggressive savings rate that in those nine points uh, uh, that Bill just covered, my recommendation of 50%, Starting from scratch, from ground zero to financial independence is about a, as I recall, the chart is about a 12-year journey. It's a 12-year journey, whether you're starting at 20 or 50 or 60. And so there you go. It's not a function of how old you are. It's a function of your savings rate and the amount of time that it takes there. If you want to get there in a shorter period of time, then a higher savings rate will do that for you. And the last comment I'd make is that it's not an on-off switch. You don't have to get to 100% financially independent based on the metric of the 4% rule 25 times. Every step you take, you get a little bit stronger. So the moment you start on your journey, the moment you start saving and investing, the moment you put the first dollar aside, you are a little bit stronger than you were the day before. And let's suppose you start the journey at, at 50 and, and you don't get to that full FI number. Well, you won't have a handful of mud either. Okay. We have a question or actually maybe two from Robin. Please ask him if he thinks the proliferation of automatic flows into index funds and the prevalence of algorithmic trading puts passive index investors at a disadvantage. If the answer is no, then why not? So I think the answer is no at, at the moment because the market is, is so large. One of the concerns people have is that if everybody starts indexing, then the mechanism of buyers and sellers constantly trying to figure out what the value of, of a given stock is would theoretically go away. Um, as, as Jack Vogel liked to point out, and I think Warren Buffett has made this point too, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, there were no index funds and the value of stocks were set entirely by the buyers and sellers day to day. Uh, but today, even though there are index funds and they're a pretty big percent of the market, I don't know what percent they are offhand, 
the market has grown so much that the part of the market that's still done by active traders is much larger than it was in 60s and 70s. So there is plenty of that kind of trading uh, going on to, to provide the function of setting value for companies. So I'm not concerned about it. Uh, I don't think index fund investors are at a disadvantage. If the, uh, the trend were to continue in such a fashion that eventually that would happen, um, then active managers would begin posting out performance. And active management, by the way, to be clear, has not gone away because most people can't accept just investing in index funds. Most people want to play the game. So, you know, they're, most people are willing to pay those fees to do it. If, in fact, that active investing were to start to be able to outperform, then people would begin to move in that direction and things would come into balance again. So it's an issue that I don't think we need to spend any time worrying about. And I'm certainly not going to ab abandon the advantages of index funds uh, to try to contribute to solve a problem that I don't see. Do we want to read the rest of that question, Bill? No, that's okay. We already okay. went over it. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead All and right. <laughs> so Jenny asks, is there anything he would change or add to his book if he were writing it today? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, Jimmy. And it's, it's one that I think about on occasion because occasionally I think that maybe I had to do a, an updated version of The Simple Path to Wealth. Um, and, but the truth is nothing fundamental. I mean, there are a lot of things in the book that uh, were time sensitive. So for instance, in various parts of the book, I talk about what the uh, limits are for an IRA contribution or for a 401k contribution or what have you. And obviously those have changed over the years as you know, the government is is increase the amount you can put in IRAs and 401ks and some of the laws around those kinds of things have changed. And so if I were to update the book, I would obviously update those kinds of numbers. And then within a couple of years, those would again be out of date. But the core principles of the book, uh, no, there's nothing I would change. And what's really been eye-opening for me is I'm this third book I'm working on or that I finished now and is coming out in October is called Pathfinders. And it's a collection of stories from people all over the world who have read The Simple Path to Wealth and adapted it to their unique circumstances. Um, and this includes a lot of people who are not residents of the United States. It's a very U.S. centric book. Um, the people who've come to the book, you know, years after I wrote it, when all those detail things had changed. And people appear to have absolutely no trouble uh, uh, looking past those specific things that are now out of date and seeing the basic principles and adapting those principles to whatever, you know, the current limits are on contributions or even at living in an entirely different country that may not have access to, this, to the specific funds I'm recommending. So I have actually, over the years, become more comfortable with the fact that the simple path to wealth is fine the way it is and probably will be fine the way it is 50 years from now, even though uh, those details will even be more out of date. I hope that makes some sense. After you achieve phi, you have a chapter where you talk about a word like living like a billionaire. Can you speak to what you mean by that uh, when we reach sort of the top of Maslow's pyramid? Well, the, the chapter is giving like a billionaire. Uh, and it's a, a chapter of, about how I, I go about uh, charitable giving. And it's, it's basically around donor advised funds, which allow you to very tax effectively uh, put a lump sum of money into uh, into a donor advised fund and and get that tax deduction in the year you do it, and then distribute that money over an extended number of years. 
So for instance, and this is, of course, is once you become wealthy, but for instance, let's suppose that uh, you want to give away a hundred thousand dollars and uh, you could give that away at twenty thousand dollars a year over the course of five years and you would have no tax advantage to that whatsoever because if you're married the standard deduction is now twenty five thousand or something like that so it would be eaten up by the standard deduction if you did it with a donor advised fund you can take that hundred thousand dollars and put it all in the fund today and then when you do your taxes for 2023 you have a hundred thousand dollar deduction now twenty five thousand of that will be eaten up by the standard deduction but still you have a seventy five thousand dollar deduction you can put against your other income and then you can still distribute that hundred thousand dollars over the next five years twenty thousand a year and then at the end of that five year period if you want to continue to do it you can make another lump sum contribution of a hundred thousand and and do it again. So that's just the more tax effective way to give money away. And the final thing I'll say is that if you follow the simple path to wealth, you will indeed become wealthy. And one of the most satisfying things I think any of us can do from a purely selfish point of view is give that money away to causes we believe in. Now, I, everybody talks about that as being a, you know, a good thing to do, a noble thing to do. And, you know, it is all of that. But at least my experience and the experience of, of a lot of the people I know, it is also selfishly the most enjoyable way to deploy the money that we've accumulated. It's just an enormously uh, satisfying thing to do. Yeah, actually, I have a donor advised fund, if not two. and it's the best way to give. It really is your own foundation. I love giving uh, appreciated shares and it creates sort of a perpetual money giving machine. You can give away the gains and things will grow and you'll never have to worry about giving cash, which to me is a disadvantage. Uh, so I we will do an episode on donor advised funds because I think giving is so important when you reach your financial freedom. And I agree with you. It does feel like giving like a billionaire. All right. We're coming to the close of our podcast. I wanted to quote from you uh, in chapter, I think, 33 of your book. You speak specifically to late starters, which I think is awesome. And your quote is, if you're a bit more seasoned, don't despair. It's never too late. It took me decades to figure this stuff out. Like mine, your road has likely already had more bumps than those who follow this path from the start will endure. But those bumps are in the past. It is your future that matters, and that starts for all of us right now. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> I love that quote. I love that quote. We need to start now. I'm a better writer than speaker. <laughs> well, at any rate, uh, we have a few last questions for you. Uh, are there any specific tips that you have for our late starter listeners, is is there anything that you'd like to tell them about this simple path to wealth? Well, we kind of we kind of covered it, so I'm 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 at the risk of repeating myself, but uh, I think I would say first of all, it's it your age doesn't matter in the sense that depending on your savings rate, it's about a 10, 12, maybe fifteen year journey. So that's true whether you're starting at 20 or you're starting at 60. Um, you don't have to finish the journey to benefit from it. You don't have to. When I say it's a 12-year journey, I mean, I'm talking about from zero to where you are financially independent is defined by the 4% rule. Um, you don't have to get all the, all the way there to benefit enormously. Every step you take, you're a little bit stronger. Um, so there's no reason, no matter what your age is, not, not to start. Um, and it's simple. Uh, it's not always easy to stay on the path, but the path itself is pretty straightforward. JL, give us an idea of some of your 
favorite resources, blogs, books, or podcasts that you would recommend to our late starter audience? Oh, there's, um, there's, there's so many. It's, it's, I, I, I hate that question because <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bound to forget wonderful resources and, and uh, offend those people if they, if they happen to listen. Um, you know, um, wow. Uh, in terms of books, you know, the, uh, one of my favorites out there is the psychology of money by Morgan Housel. Um, I, I, I think it's a wonderful book in and of itself. It's, it's a, a, in many ways, a perfect companion to uh, my book. And I guess I tend to think of uh, books in in that way um quit like a millionaire by uh, uh by my friends christy and bryce uh when they're millennials so kind of the millennial journey for uh you know almost a case study of of how they did it uh, again a great companion to to my book um in terms of blogs uh well their blog is a is a great one uh, you know millennial revolution uh uh, Mr. Money Mustache is uh, is a classic. Uh, the Mad Scientist doesn't write too much uh, anymore, but he, you know he does he does great stuff. Um, the Choose Fi podcast is is a great resource. Uh, the Earn and Invest podcast is a great resource. Um, this podcast is a great resource. <laughs> Thanks. I, yeah, I, I mean, you know, but all the other podcasts are podcasters are now angry at me. All the other book authors are angry at me. So, so thanks a lot, Becky. I, I know I, I have a whole new <laughs> I backed you into a corner, didn't I? <laughs> but, but you yeah, know, I, I, I think the point of this is it, yeah. it is learnable, right? It, it, it is doable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's doable. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. It's uh, in fact, and that's that's one of if I could tell my own new book coming up. One of the things I love about Pathfinders, and when we started on this book, you know, we put out the call for these stories. I, yeah, I had no idea if who would respond or if the stories would be any good or if they'd be usable. And and you know, frankly, we got some that weren't, uh, but we got about a hundred that were great. And. Uh, the thing that's most inspiring to me is is how doable it is it really it really um, there is a trope out there that oh you know financial independence is is only for white male engineers and i'm a white male i'm not an engineer as it happens but that's just absolutely nonsense and it's been nonsense from the beginning and i i've just met all kinds of people uh, that are not white male engineers who have done it. And Pathfinders is a book filled with stories of people who, who, you know, at first glance, you would think they don't have a chance. I mean, this is, you know, it's not like we're replacing engineers with, uh, you know, bankers or something. I mean, you're, you're talking about people who, who start from incredibly humble beginnings. That's one of the things that I, that I like about quit like a millionaire is Christy Shen um, really grew up in abject poverty in China and she's a millionaire, uh, you know, so putting certainly, a, you know, a, a lie to the idea that, you know, you have to be a certain kind of person or you, have to already be born into privileged circumstances or something like that. So yeah, it's truly, it's a path for everybody. It's a matter of whether or not you want to take it. And, you know, when you talk about savings rates and, and, you know, I have people tell me all the time, I couldn't possibly save 50% of my income. Well, that's, in, well, it, it depends on what you want. You know, if, if you want financial independence, then you'll figure that out. If you want other things more than financial independence, and let's be clear about this, most people do want those other things more, then that's okay. I mean, I, you know, it's your money. You can spend it however you want. Uh, but whatever you're spending on, that's that's what you want. 
And I, but if you want financial independence, it's perfectly doable. You're going to have to do things differently. You know, you're not going to become financially independent doing what you're doing now, I'm assuming you're not financially independent, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that you have chosen not to do it. And again, that's a legitimate choice. I would never presume to tell anybody else what to do with their money. But I will presume to say that don't tell me you can't do it when really what you're telling me is you're choosing to do something else. Well, this has been an excellent resource. You're so generous with your time and your knowledge. We want to thank you profusely for joining us today. We'd like also to let our audience know where they can reach you should they have additional questions and need some reassurance or support or encouragement. Well, first of all, I'm I'm honored that you would ask and it's a it's a privilege to be on the on the podcast. As I mentioned already, I think it's one of the best resources out there. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. We're young, we're new, we're growing and uh we feel that our audience is an underserved, overlooked audience that is really, as you've mentioned, the majority. It's the majority of America that are consider themselves late starters. And um, we're hoping to reach them. So we appreciate uh, your force. Now, your book is a game changer. I want the whole world to read it. Wouldn't the world be just such a better place if we all follow the simple path to wealth? Well, I mean, you know, I, I I think so. And it's 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 very gratifying and humbling and a, a little amazing to me, quite honestly, to hear people tell me how it has changed their their life for the better. Um, but to finish answering your question, uh, the blog is JL Collins NH, which stands for New Hampshire, where we used to live, at uh dot com. And I'm very bad at answering questions. So, uh, you know, I like to go on podcasts, but the blog has a wonderful search function. So if you want to know what I think about something, you can enter the search function and probably find it as people might have gathered from our conversation. You know, one of the line of questions that I hear a lot is, you know, well, what do you think about bonds now today? And well, as you've heard, my views don't change based on, and the simple path to wealth doesn't change based on what's happening day to day. So if I've written about bonds, that's my view on bonds. If for some reason something changes, then I then I write about it. So the search function is a good one. And then from the blog, if you want to follow me on Twitter or Facebook, you you know, you can you can go from there. JL, would you tell us about uh, the Pathfinders book. When is it coming out and how can people uh, connect with that? So it's it's coming out in uh, uh, October 31st. And if anybody's interested in it uh, and you want to do me a favor, you can pre-order it. The reason that's a favor, an advantage to me if you pre-order it now rather than when it comes out is evidently my publisher tells me that that influences the number of copies bookstores will order depending on how the pre-orders go and so maybe in the show notes we can put a link for for how to pre-order it uh, and we've already talked a little bit about the nature of the book so i won't i won't i won't bore you with that but yeah so it's available for pre-order now it's available for pre-order now great great thanks for that well jl this has been amazing uh, i just have really enjoyed this conversation, again, I want to tell you how much difference you made in my life personally with your book, The Simple Path to Wealth. And I know that it has affected, like I said before, hundreds of thousands of people. And you gave me the tools I needed to do what I wanted to accomplish. And which is, you know, there's nothing special about me. I'm just the average Joe. And I think that anyone can can glean what they need out of your book. So thank you. And thanks for being here with us today. We've really enjoyed it. Well, I, it's as I say, Becky, it's truly my honor. And I'm uh, uh, I'm I'm pleased that, that you would extend the invitation. And it's it's hanging out with you guys and talking has been a blast. I've enjoyed every moment of it. And thanks to your audience for the questions they they put out. Great stuff.
Well, thanks again, JL. We'll see you hopefully soon. I'll look forward to it.